Monikwitig, The Straight Mind, and Other Essays. Preface by Monikwitig. Tucson, January 1991. Materialist lesbianism, this is what I would call the political and philosophical approach of the first half of this collection of essays. I describe heterosexuality not as an institution but as a political regime which rests on the submission and the appropriation of women. In desperate straits, exactly as it was for serfs and slaves, women may choose to be runaways and try to escape their class or group, as lesbians do, and, or, to renegotiate daily, and term by term, the social contract. There is no escape, for there is no territory, no other side of the Mississippi, no Palestine, no Liberia for women. The only thing to do is to stand on one's own feet as an escapee, a fugitive slave, a lesbian. One must accept that my point of view may appear crude, and no wonder, considering all the centuries it has had against it. First one must step out of the tracks of politics, philosophy, anthropology, history, cultures, to understand what is really happening. Then one might have to do without the munificent philosophical toy of dialectics, because it does not allow one to conceive of the opposition of men and women in terms of class conflict. One must understand that this conflict has nothing eternal about it and that to overcome it one must destroy politically, philosophically, and symbolically the categories of men and women. Dialectics has let us down. Therefore the comprehension of what materialism and materiality are belongs to us. Here I will list a few names, names of those without whom I would not have been empowered to attack conceptually the straight world. By order of publication of their work, Nicole Claude Mathieu, Christine Delphi, Colette Guillaume, Paola Darbe, Saint Saig represent for me the most important political influences during the time I wrote these essays. Each one of them deserves a chapter. Mathieu was the first to establish women in the social sciences as a sociological and anthropological entity, that is, not as appendages to men, but as a group which stands on its own. She is the originator of what she has called the anthropology of the sexes. But she is a philosopher as well as an anthropologist in the French tradition. Her last essay on consciousness is a landmark. Mathieu gives us the missing link in the history of consciousness by providing an analysis of consciousness as oppressed, which does not mean consciousness as alienated. Delphi coined the expression materialist feminism, and she changed the Marxist concept of class, showing it to be obsolete since it does not take into account the kind of work that has no exchange value, work that represents two-thirds of the work provided globally, according to recent figures of the United Nations. Guillemin transformed the point of view on materialism and materiality in such a way that after her it cannot be recognized. One has to read Guillemin to understand that what we have called materialism until now was very far from the mark, since the most important aspect of materiality was ignored. There is, on the one hand, the physical and mental exertion attached to the kind of work that is merely physical service to one or several persons without any compensation in wages, and, on the other hand, the physical and mental implications of the kind of work that robs the whole person of herself night and day. But Guillemin is more widely known to have defined the double aspect of the oppression of women, a private appropriation by an individual, a husband or a father, and a collective appropriation of the whole group, including celibate individuals by the class of men. In other words, sexage. If you are unmarried, you will have to be available to take care of the sick, the aged, the weak, as nuns and volunteer workers do whether they belong to your family or not. Tabet, in working in the anthropology of the sexes, has provided a link between women as collectively appropriated. Particularly in her last works on prostitution, she shows that there is a continuum between so-called prostitutes and lesbians as a class of women who are not privately appropriated but are still collectively the object of heterosexual oppression. Psyche, with whom I wrote Lesbian Peoples, material for a dictionary in the play The Constant Journey, made me understand that the effects of oppression on the body, giving it its form, its gestures, its movement, its motricity, and even its muscles, have their origin in the abstract domain of concepts, through the words that formalize them. I was thinking of her work as an actor and as a writer when I said, in the mark of gender, that language casts sheaves of reality upon the social body, stamping it and violently shaping it, for example, the bodies of social actors, there are many other important names I have not mentioned, Colette Carpitan, Monique Plaza, 
Emmanuel de la Sepsa, Louise Tourcourt, Daniela Charret, Suzette Triton, Claudie Le Cellier, etc. But I am only enumerating the people who had a direct influence on my way of thinking. These collected essays are divided in two parts. The first half, as I have already mentioned, is a political discussion. With category of sex I wanted to show sex as a political category. The word gender already used in England and in the United States seemed to me imprecise. In one is not born a woman, there is an attempt to establish a link between women fighting for women as a class, against the idea of woman as an essentialist concept. In the straight mind, I sketch the thought which throughout the centuries built heterosexuality as a given. The social contract discusses the idea that there is an issue beyond the heterosexual social contract. Homo sum is about political thought and the future of dialectics. In the second half of this collection I mention the object of my main concern, writing. My first book, The Apopanax, was supported by the French New Novel, a school of writers whom I will always admire for the way they have revolutionized the novel and for their stand for literature as literature. They have taught me what work is in literature. In the point of view, universal or particular I touch upon the problem of a work of art in which the literary forms cannot be perceived because the theme of the work, here homosexuality, predominates. The Trojan Horse is a discussion of language as raw material for the writer and of how violently literary forms affect their context when they are new. This essay has been developed in an unpublished work which I call the Literary Workshop. Le Chartier Littéraire in Mark of Gender I examine the original meaning of gender and how it represents the linguistic index of women's material oppression. The site of action focuses on language as the ultimate social contract, an idea that Natalie Sarot's work inspired. Different journals have been involved in publishing texts on the new materialism. The first was Questions Feminists, whose collective invited me to join them when I first came to the United States. At that time I worked on the preparation of a series of seminars in the French department at the University of California, Berkeley. I was trying to inaugurate on my own an epistemological revolution in the approach to the oppression of women. It was then that I joined with enthusiasm this group whose members were working in the same direction. Feminist Issues was begun in Berkeley a few years later to address the concept of feminist materialism, and their collective invited me to be their advisory editor. In spite of the conflict we had in France on the lesbian question, the American editors, Mary Jo Lakeland and Susan Ellis Wolfe, decided that this question would not injure the journal and that it would receive the attention that it deserved in an international framework. Amazon Dear, Lesbienne d'Aujourd'hui was published in Montreal by radical lesbians led by Louise Tourcourt and Daniela Charret who understood both the necessity of a theory of feminist materialism and the necessity of going beyond it through the theory and the struggle that they have adopted and developed.